to remember just to turn something down so that we don't get feedback. I'll grab a I'll grab a quick cushion so I can be a little oh. higher up. There we go. That will help. Comfy. Get comfy. <laughs> to, uh... <laughs> yes, it's just uh, just that yes. right there. We go. Turn that one off. Okay. Right. I think we are nearly there, Lee. <laughs> Got your cushion. Got oh. your comfy. Right. Let's just. Sorry, there's that many buttons to have to deal with. Um, okay, this one, and this one. It's all very exciting, Braca. We're in your rocket ship right now. My great pleasure to introduce to you, for those of you who do not know uh, the wonderful Lee Harris yet, um, he's agreed a great honor it is to be on the channel today and um i'm just going to give him a round of applause here goes <laughs> <laughs> braca the honor is mine um thank you for having me <laughs> it's just a delight to be with you today lee um i think a lot of people already know you um, you, Lee Harris, um, Lee Harris Energy. Lee is an intuitive, a way shower. He does monthly energy forecasts on YouTube, which I think many of you already see. I certainly follow them, find them very, extremely valuable. And he also does weekly podcasts. He's got a members portal where you can go more deeply into his work. And he's also a musician. He produces videos, audios, music, retreats, trainings, workshops. Your work is so vast, Lee. Where do we start? I'm so <laughs> curious about every aspect of your life. I don't really know where to start. So where would you like to start today? What would you like to share about you and your, your life? at this time. Thank you. And uh, you were one of my favorite guests on my weekly podcast. And like I said to you, when we just touched in before we started, when I went to bed last night and I knew I was gonna be with your shining bright energy this morning, I was like, oh, that's great. That's how I start my day with a good dose of Braca. So thank you so much. Um, I think you know, it's funny, as you ask me that question, what comes to mind is channeling. And uh, I was someone who, through my teens, like many of us, had various issues or, you know, you might call them wounds or things I needed to heal, basically, to try and pull myself out of some of the compression and suppression that I was living in. And what I now realize years and years later that I didn't know at the time is it was my sensitivity and my intuition that I was abandoning or that I didn't know how to access, as is the case for many of us if we aren't taught or trained. So I took myself into the self-growth and metaphysical field as a student, and it was love at first touch. You know, uh, like many, I'm sure I would do whatever I was doing in the week whether it was I was at university or whether it was one of the many jobs I had. And then at the weekend or at night, my passion would be to come home. And it was either music or self-growth. They were kind of the two places. And, and honestly, music is a healing force. So, um, but what happened to me when I was 23 is I heard the voice of my guides. And I think it was a very positive influence on me as a person because it was very challenging. I did not want to be a channeler. And honestly, I was a little skeptical of channeling, even though I was, you know, a fully signed up member of the healing world. <laughs> uh, channeling to me just was like a bridge too far. I would have rather been a tarot reader, you know, because to me that was a, still a bit more grounded. You're connecting with the other side, but it's not necessarily going 
to those levels where you're speaking to guides and beings and also being British and living in England at the time, because I've lived in America now for nine years. Um, yeah, it wasn't the coolest <laughs> or the most comfortable thing to have to be able to tell my friends. But long story short, um, after many years of channeling privately in secret and for friends who knew me, I, I had a partner at the time who was also a channeler. And so we started doing work together and it's interesting. I didn't know there was like a whole channeling world. Like there were people who wanted to go to channeled events and, and especially here in America. So I found that, you know, after doing approximately, I would say seven or eight years of working as a channeler and also as a facilitator and guiding people through their spiritual process, I had come to recognize that while channeling is a fantastic thing and like any practice, it can greatly enhance and change your life. It was best used as part of a balanced diet. If you only went to channeling all the time, you could find yourself out there or you could make decisions that were rooted in spirit that were blowing up in your face on, on, on earth. And I, I went through those periods and I saw lots of people going through those periods. So the reason that I started doing energy updates was I thought it's a way that I can take some of that channeled information, but come down the ladder rungs a few steps and explain it in, in more human terms as to how it might be showing up for us. So that was how I ended up doing my energy updates. And I think that's how you and I found each other because unbeknownst to each other, we would both enjoy each other's videos and then we connected and yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> Yes, yes. Gosh, that's um, you've you've piqued my interest. I'd like to go a little deeper, uh, if I may, because I'm curious. I notice this is a word that you use on many of your Impact the World interviews. You say I'm curious because you are genuinely interested in the people that you speak to. Yes, you really have uh, wonderful listening skills. I wonder if that's something that you always had. Was this something very natural to you? Uh, as a musician, that you were always a good listener and always very observant. Is this a quality, would you say, that of a yeah. good intuitive? I, I, th I, I, think, I think probably my listening, like probably many people, has developed over the years. I'm, I, I know for sure there were times in my 20s I wish I'd listened more, um, but that was my 20s. So um, I, I think, yeah, I think the listening actually for me with people and you, I think you know this because you've done your private readings too. I gave personal sessions for, I think it was 14 years before I stopped in 2019. And yes, it was 15 years. And I think that cultivates uh, a way of focusing on somebody and of receiving about somebody that I think then by the time I got to impact the world, what was really important to me with my podcast, I didn't want to just be another podcast where people interviewed people about the work they were doing, even though there's great value in that. I feel, especially in the spiritual community, and I know this happened to me, when we first come into the spiritual community, there can tend to be a distancing between ourselves and the teacher or the speaker or the astrologer or the intuitive that we follow. And it's not actually even about distancing yourself from that human being. We've all been trained to distance ourselves from spirit, whether it's God or whether it's spirit. And the problem with that distance is it leaves you in a risky place. So it's not good for a teacher or a speaker to be guruized. It's not good for them either. It might take some of them years and years to work that out when it all falls apart. But it's not good for anyone when we're in that place of, seeing power as outside ourselves. And I think it's normal because we have been so under cultivated spiritually as people uh, for us to think, oh, I don't know anything about that. I'll just give all my power away to Braca or to this other person. And, and I think there's a maturation process that you go through. Um, so for me, with Impact the World, what I wanted to do, and I, I'm not always successful at this, I suppose it depends also on the, the person I'm talking to and where they, where they will go. But I wanted to demystify 
and bring in the humanness and the journey of people who were out there in the world doing things that were impactful because I knew that more and more of us were going to be needed to do our thing. And that doesn't always look like you have to write a book or you have to have a YouTube channel. But the truth is the lessons are the same. If you are wanting to create something in your local community for 20 people, the lessons and the stuff that you'll go through internally can be very similarly mapped onto what somebody will go through when they're taking on an endeavor that perhaps involves more people or is more public. So I wanted to get under the hood of as many different minds and journeys as, as I could in the hope that Impact the World would not only introduce people to great people doing great work in the world like yourself, but more importantly, make them go, oh, I see, that's how Bracker got through that. Or Lee just shared a personal story of what he got through. For me, that's always the best. Like I love, I'm not interested in hearing people's accolades. It really doesn't interest me at all. I'm really interested in hearing about the struggle and how someone got through it. Because if I hadn't figured out how to get through some of my struggles at the levels that I've managed to get through them, I would have been, I would have been in a very bad place now. So that that for me is 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 I think why. The gift of that podcast for me is when I and a speaker like yourself really go there and really get vulnerable and honest about what's going on. That is a gift to me as well, and hopefully to the to the viewers and the listeners. Yes, yes. I mean, every time I see one of your episodes coming out, I'm like, oh, goody, there's a new oh. one. He's just released another one. Yes. So it's really exciting. And um, it brings me on to, I, I was fascinated to... Um, learn your journey that in 2004, I believe, was when you started uh, doing these uh, private readings for, I think you, you had like a, a donation of about 10 pounds when yes. you started. When yeah, because I was working in a pub. Yes. Um, and I was I was working in a pub, I was trying to get music going. So I had a job in a pub and I had a job in my friend, a pub, by the way, is a bar. <laughs> if you're not from England, uh, or Ireland or um, Scotland. Um, yeah, and I'm sure it's called a pub somewhere else in the world too. But so I had a job in a bar at night. And I worked for my friend's uh, business doing admin in the day. So she was a horse whisperer and she booked private clients. And she also promoted some horse whispers in the UK, which wasn't a world I was familiar with, but I loved it. I thought, oh, this is great. So I was doing work for her. And um, yeah, the readings were something that I had been doing privately for friends, just as, you know, as gifts and, and as training um, for a few years. And... I did one for a yoga teacher friend and she said to me, I've, you should do this. You should be doing this as a job. And I was like, Oh, no. <laughs> you know, all the stuff come. Oh my God, I couldn't. What a responsibility. And what if I get it wrong? And well, oh, you know, all that stuff that you go through. And uh, luckily I was in a period where I was going to workshops to overcome fear. I mean, that was my focus that year. I mean, there were many focuses, but that year I was trying to say yes when I wanted to say no not against good, you know, not stupidly. Like, you know, if someone said jump off this building, I might go, no, I don't think so. But I was trying to say yes when I recognized my fear was coming from unknowns rather than knowns. So I said, yes, I didn't think anyone would come. And yeah, I did 60 clients in 60 days. And what happened was people just, it spread and people would tell their friends. And I also think there was no financial barrier. I think if I'd have gone out there and been 50 pounds or 100 pounds, it would have been a very different story. But I would never have done that because at that point I didn't, you know, I didn't, I, I wasn't tested. I wasn't proved to myself and I wasn't going to charge people properly until I knew that it was, uh, it was working. So the reason I came up with 10 pounds was um, I knew it would take me 75 to 90 minutes to do each reading because I was writing them all at the time, about 2000 words. Luckily, I was a fast typer and um, I would write what I'd hear for this person and, and a response to their questions. And I thought, well, I earn seven pounds an hour in the pub. <laughs> so if I could earn 10 pounds for an hour and a half, I'd, well, that's great. I would rather do this than, you know, so honestly, it was if I think that and still when I think back to it, it was I mean, I think in a way it looks like a miracle to me when I look around at what I'm doing now, because I could never have foreseen this or the development of it, or all the things that me and my team get to do. 
but I'll go right back to, it was a miracle to me that I was doing that for work very privately because no one in my life really knew what I was doing, at least for the first six to 12 months. And having these deeply intimate experiences with people I, I would probably never meet who would send me emails saying they were crying and thank you so much. So honestly, it was, it was the most extraordinary, heart-opening, mind-opening time. Thank you. And you know, what you know, because you've, you've held space for people in that way. It's an incredible privilege and it's incredibly intimate. And, and for a while, it can kind of make other interactions <laughs> seem quite boring. I, I think there's a period you go through, you're like, oh, God, I, I went really deep with this person today. So I can't just sit here and talk about EastEnders right now. You know, you get over it, you adjust. But there's definitely a, a period where your life changes because of it. Oh, yes, most definitely. And um What's amazing is that how have you gone from in, in what I see as a relatively short time period, Lee, from £10 an hour to a seven-figure business mm. with 14 international production crew and all the people who are working with you as a great team producing and you've got this wonderful wonderful course that you're doing to help people own their value own your value i believe and it is if you'd like to talk more about that because there's only a short window to sign up for that sure. so please uh, tell yeah. us a little more you know what was so interesting i before impact the world was a podcast it was the name of my first ever live training for healers who wanted to do it for work and not just healers, creatives too. I had a lot of artists come and I often say that the starving artist and the starving healer mentality are the same because I've been both. <laughs> you know, I've been the starving artist who couldn't get his music off the ground and I was never actually a starving healer. That was the weirdest thing about it. It, it kind of, after two years, I was able to go full time. So I do recognize I was very lucky that I was able to almost effortlessly while I was trying to make something else work, this other thing on the left was blowing up around me. And all I had to do was keep showing up and do the work. So when I did this training, it was five days long and I took people through 22 modules. It was, it was big. I mean, we would do like 9.30 to 7 p.m. every day. And the most interesting thing was of all these 22 sessions, Every time I went into a session that either involved money or self-confidence, people in the room froze. And I was like, wow. And I had some, you know, there were some people in that room who were, and money isn't the important thing, but just to give you an, a context, some of the people in that room were making six figures a year, which to me is a huge success. Like to be able to make six figures a year doing your passion is, is you've already won as far as I'm concerned. So it was so interesting to me. I thought, wow, look at this. Every time I teach one of these modules that comes around, that goes, goes to our value or to money, the room freezes. And there were 65 people from all over the world in that room. So that really told me, oh, owning our value is a huge block. That's actually one of the biggest blocks. Now, I knew this personally because every time I would raise my prices with my personal sessions, I would go through all kinds of stuff emotionally, cycle, like, but I would always know it was time. It was like, no, you're, you, you, you can, you can do this. The people who can afford to work with you will pay the money and then you will use the money to pay people to help you create free videos. So to me, there was a logic. The logic was if I can hire myself out, and people value what I do at this level, and I have a three month waiting list, I can, I'm in the position, not saying you should, but for me, I was in the position where I could raise my prices and then I could use that money to pay team members. And I started off with one team member, then I got two. And just as time went on, um, I really, I think that I think the biggest key to it, honestly, is, I realized many years later that for me, my self-growth that used to be contained in healing and spirituality had very actively become the work I did. So in much the same way that the work I offer out, 
hopefully helps and supports the people who resonate with it. And of course, there'll be loads of people who don't like the way I do it or don't resonate with me. You know, that's fine. That's always going to happen. Um, but for me, the growth was internal. And every time I grew, I went through a big change. And I almost quit doing this work in 20, end of 2015, I was wondering about stopping. I was wondering about stopping doing the videos on energy on, on YouTube. And, and it's interesting, I got offered the opportunity by an agency to go on tour across America. And I was didn't know what to do at that point. I was still thinking, am I going to stop this? Is this too intense for me? Is this, could I be doing something better? because I think I'd got to a plateau. And um, I went on this tour and meeting all the people, and we actually also went to Germany and Australia, all the people I met changed my mind because they would come up to me at the end of an event and they would say, your video, you know, in some of the biggest cases, your video saved me from depression or your video pulled me out of, of what I was in. And my truth about this is for anyone watching or listening, you would be amazed what you can offer, whether that's to your friend or whether that's on YouTube or in a book. We often doubt what we have to offer each other. And yet the truth is we all have something to offer each other. So my shift really around the work was when I had that epiphany that I wanted to carry on because I saw what it was doing for people. And that actually was enough for me. Like my heart got touched. Then I thought, okay, I need to do this differently going forward. I need to grow. And I don't know what that will look like, but I'm going to make an intention that I'll grow. And so then I started studying and I started looking at I learned a bit more about business, which was an area I'd freaked out about and stayed away from. But when I did study business, I was like, oh, I've been quite intuitive about business all along. And actually, there are aspects of me that know how to do this. So it's been a real growth journey for me. And the reason I created Own Your Value was because I wanted to, um, you know, give a bit of a roadmap to people who resonate with either the way I do it or the way I teach it or some of the elements of my work that they wanted to know the behind the scenes of. And it's a lot, a lot of the course is mindset. So I actually spend a lot of time walking people through their thoughts and feelings about things in a way, reverse engineering some of the stuff I went through the hard way, I hope. <laughs> and based on feedback, it seems to be working. Uh, so yeah, I, that was the big shift for me. I would say 2016 was the year that I committed more than ever after giving myself almost a year of considering stopping. Gosh, well, I have to say, we're very glad you didn't stop. Oh, thank you. Well, I am too. Really? Yeah, <laughs> I am really. too. Yeah, um, thank you for going through whatever you needed to go through, because, you know, when you're thinking of stopping something, there's usually a hump to go over mm. to get to the other side. And it sounds like you maybe change some of the ways that you were doing things to make your, uh, the, to make it a little easier maybe, or to make it more meaningful. Yes, and here's the irony. I was just thinking this the other day. I work more consistently and more strongly than I ever have. Whereas in 2015, 2016, I was tired. So what I realized was I'm tired of, because I've hit a wall, not because I'm tired. I'm tired because I need to reinvent the way I do this. I need to reinvent how, you know, and, and that's very common. Like you'll hear that from many, many people. And so, you know, one of the things I always say is if you feel stuck or you've hit a wall, you don't necessarily have to destroy the thing that you've built, which again, I was giving myself permission to do because that gave, that gave me a freedom and a power and it got me very honest with myself. Um, but you can, you can reshape or rejig. So for example, with you, I loved a couple of years ago, oh, great, Brack has changed her name. Oh, she's painting now. You know, it's so sweet to kind of, I, I don't know about you, I love watching our progress, especially those of us who've been out there a while. You see contemporaries and you're like, oh, that's cool. They're doing that now. And for me, all that's a mirror of is our multidimensionality as human beings. So those of us who do public work, you get a snapshot of that growth through our public work. But if it isn't someone's public work, it's your friend or your sister or your, you know, your child, and you're just getting to watch human growth. It's, it's, it's lovely. It's beautiful. It's inspiring, isn't it? Yeah. 
no, I think I think that's beautiful the way you the way you put that and that everybody has got something to work through and to keep reinventing yourself. Because when we last spoke and you kindly interviewed me on Impact the World, and much changed after that interview, actually, because I've okay. up until then been doing a lot of personal readings. And it was after that that I began to reduce that workload and move into some new areas uh, and uh, just do things quite differently. So thank you. You really inspired me oh, by your firm decision to stop doing your readings. That was it's a, a hard decision. decision. It's a hard decision because it's beautiful work and, you know, it's intimate and, and, and yeah, it, it's a hard decision, but it, if it's the right decision, it's important to make. And you can always go back. That's what I told myself. I'm like, you know, if, if I decide I can always go back, I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be someone who'll want a reading. And so I can always return. They'd be queuing up for you, Lee. <laughs> would you? I, we can do it at the end if you like, or would you like to ask, we're on Own Your Value, would you like to just share a, a little more about that uh, and about, I think there's a deadline date of the 29th of September. Yeah, we are actually closing the course and I think I'm retiring the course at this point. Um, I created it a couple of years ago. I've, I've added um, some new material, but I, I don't know. I just thought, mm, okay, I might, I might revisit this in 2023 and create a new course. But, um, but if you do join by the 29th, you will have access to all the material. Um, so perhaps the best thing to do might be to go to ownyourvalue.world um, and check it out. Because um, I, I, as much as I'm happy to talk more about the course, I also know unless someone's interested in the course, I, I would, I would love to have the time with you to talk about, you know, what's what's relevant. Braca, it's not like there's nothing going on on planet Earth right now, or, or am I confused? Is that just the world I'm oh, living in? <laughs> well, shall we talk about it then? Shall we talk about the oh, white boy. elephant in the room? <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. And I, I think I said this to you on the interview. There was a day I was having about. I don't know, it's probably the first few months of, you know, the COVID lockdowns. And uh, it was interesting because you and Pam just popped up on my news, on my YouTube feed, you know, of channels that I follow. And it was you, the lovely Pam Gregory, who is brilliant. And you two just had this lovely chat. And it was everything I needed that day. I was like, oh, just thank you. I just had a nice chat with, with Pam and Bracca. And this whole, you know, S show suddenly you know I needed them to make sense of it for me and and I love that that's how we can all help each other because I think there are so many ups and downs in this time and I know people who are just having an extraordinary time and the best time of their life and I love that and I celebrate that and then I know people who've been more challenged than ever before so it's interesting to find your own balance point in the middle of all of that I think it's it's challenging you know it's kind of a, a new way of being and working on the planet yes and how, how has it changed your world would you say i will say that one of the great gifts for me was it slowed down my live event schedule and you know you know sometimes you don't realize you've outgrown uh your old outfit because you've bought a new one and you're trying to wear both at the same time. And you just look like somebody who put too many clothes on. <laughs> and so for me, what had happened was all of the uh, work we were doing online had really grown. And yet I hadn't really calmed down my live event schedule. So I think it was interesting that for me, it released me from that. And as much as I love live events and I, I do look forward to doing some again in the future, um, it helped me consolidate my energy actually. And it made me realize there was a level of stimulation in the outside world that I didn't need, <laughs> that I just kind of got used to coping with. And I, I, I share my story through live events. I think I've heard that from many people. So I feel like I got to befriend my introvert a bit more and I think he was crying out for me so that he could have a bit more repair and recovery time because it's the extrovert side of me that I use for my work so that was a really good thing um, I think the thing that has been challenging you know I've had personal losses like we lost my dad early in COVID and um, not seeing my family but I also will say that I found it 
a strangely elevating and positive time. And, and my biggest challenge, I would say, especially doing the work that we do um, and engaging with people's emotional energy all the time is, is finding a balance point with people's emotions, like uh, the, the high ups and downs that people are going through. And I, whenever I do an energy update or anything that's facing me to the group, um, I feel it quite strongly. So it's made me take care of myself in a stronger way and put more things in my life that support me so that I can in turn do the work I do to support others. So I think it's just it's tightened me up a bit in a good way. It's wonderful, Lee. Thank you. And how about how about for you? How about for me? Well, it took me to New Zealand and back. Oh, that's <laughs> during fantastic. During a pandemic, <laughs> which is another story. But I've just written up the burning learnings from that, which I will be sharing. So uh, right. there was a lot to learn in a six-month period. It was very intense. And um, mm. I was in a rut and I didn't realize I was in a rut. Mm. Yeah. So it was painful but uh, a lot has a lot of good things have come from it so yeah i would say to people who are listening if you're going through something that's very painful very often there are diamonds and pearls that come out of that pain afterwards so so true hang in there and um you know listen to lee and his forecasts and anything that uplifts you and uh, you'll, you'll make it through, yeah? And I, I know we're all a little different, but one of the things I had to learn repeatedly and still apply is if I'm in a, a tight spot like that, whether it's, a, I haven't been in a big bad rut for a, a long, long time, thankfully, touch at the moment anyway. And, um, and uh, but the mini ones come, of course, and life throws you challenges. But for me, the, the biggest thing has been learning to, allow myself to feel whatever I feel without getting too caught in the judgment or the story of it, which is easy to do. You know, you're feeling bad and then you start telling yourself a story that your life's never going to change. Well, that's not actually true. That's the mind scaring you even more, which suppresses the feeling. And I've done that so many times. And so I've learned now, let the feeling be there and try not to fight the state you're in. Because often when we hit that state, I know for me, sometimes it's inconvenient. I'm like, oh, I've got too much to do this week. I didn't need this. You know, that would be my old story. Okay. And actually the truth is, well, this is happening. So uh, are you going to, are you going to let life be included in your week or are you going to try and organize life? And it's like, oh yeah. Okay. So I think, I think there is something to that surrender process to these healing waves we get that, especially now, if you can learn to really ride those waves when they come, they go so much faster than A, if we were trying to control or organize them, but B, than they would have a decade ago. That's the interesting thing of these times. We've got these massively fast healing waves that anyone who is awake to energy can feel and can ride. And I think that's also why so many people are having incredible breakthroughs at the moment and feeling more alive and purposeful than they ever have. So... Yes. So true what you said about the diamonds that will sometimes take a year to appear and in retrospect, they're easier to see. But um, yeah, we often break down to break through. Yes, that's beautiful because one of the viewers actually asked, how can I go from feelings of utter despair to feelings of joy and love? You know, how are the techniques? Is there something I can do? And uh, what would you, what would be your answer be to that at this point? Yeah. Uh, the, one of the things that I think happens when we're in trauma, you know, despair, depression, when we're in active uh, traumatizing emotion, or we've been going for weeks through trauma or despair or de depression, we lose our ability to lead ourselves, usually. You know, we, it's, that, it's that thing of when you're depressed, you're like, oh, well, I know I should do some exercise or eat better, or, but I'm not. And the reason that we get into that state is that we've become coated in the heaviness to such a degree that it immobilizes us. So in a way, we've got frozen there. So a couple of things to do is firstly to ask yourself, what's my positive support system? Is there enough positive support in my life? 
are there any other people I can think of or friends I can think of who might be willing to give me some advice if I were to ask them to have a phone call and share with them what I'm going through and that I had a feeling maybe they might have some advice? Who can I reach out to? Or if you're in a position to be able to find professional help, and there are so many great things I'm seeing now around um, much more affordable online therapy and all kinds of things. If you're in a position to do that, make sure you get as much support of whatever kind you can do in your life first and foremost. But secondly, what I learned about the times I was really depressed in my life was that I had to learn to be patient, that it would take time to come out. So as much as I wanted my depression to be gone by Friday <laughs> on Monday, I had to be a bit more realistic and go, well, there might be joyous moments on Friday, but I've been in this now for six months or nine months. And, and again, I'm talking emotional and healing. I know many people have a medical diagnosis of depression or they have certain chronic depression issues you might be dealing with, but it's really important to kind of, for me, keep a list when you're in those moments of things that make you feel better. And I think where we go wrong with this is the first response someone can have, well, I'm depressed, nothing's going to make me feel better. And I'm like, I understand. I didn't ask you to feel joyous and I didn't ask you to feel excited because those are two big arcs and it might take months to let those back into your body. But first of all, we're looking for relief we're looking for peace and we're looking for healthy soothing. We're looking for something that soothes you that doesn't cost you on the other end. So, you know, for some people, a bottle of wine might soothe them, but they aren't going to feel great the next day. And what's that doing to your body over a period of time? So healthy soothing would be things that comfort you, soothe you, make you feel better, give you, give you and your nervous system some release and periods of time where you notice you're not obsessing about the future or obsessing about something. So you start to give your emotions a place to grow and expand rather than stay tightly in, in the emotion that you're feeling that is a low or a tight one, like despair or depression. So I, I used to find having a list was handy. And trust me, I did not want to write that damn list when I was depressed. So I had to, I had to kind of like keep them in a drawer. And then a year or two later, if I hit another wave, I would go to that and I would look at it. And I would include things like uh, nutrition and I would include things like supplements. You know, I would, I would, I, by, as, as I developed, I would, I would do a whole body thing. It would be, have I painted lately? And even if I just paint for 10 minutes and I don't paint a masterpiece or I don't paint something I love, I'm painting for the process of painting and moving my emotions. So just practicing little things. So I think first and foremost, you need support. And then second, you need some kind of leadership or laundry list from yourself that you make that sometimes you might be annoyed that you're going to that list. I don't want to paint right now. My negotiation point with myself was always, you can do it for five minutes, then you can come back to your misery. Then you can come back to the sofa. Then you can, you know, watch Golden Girls all day again um, or whatever your thing is, you know. So it, you have to, you know, you have to develop just enough of a part of you that is willing to heal. Even if most of you is angry that you're in this place, is angry at the world, is upset, is devastated, all of those things can be there. But we need to cultivate that one part of us that sees a chink of light. And maybe it's watching Bracker videos all week, and that's as much as I can muster. But after watching Bracker for a week, I'm like, wow. She's got some good energy. I've just drunk in some of that. And, and how, do I, how do I now move forward? And I use you as an example, Bracker, because you're not faking it. You're not out there pretending to be sunny when you're not. You know, you're honest. You know, you're, you've, you've been through the wars, which I always think, actually, people who have been through the wars in their life and still want to cultivate light, for me, they're the most rich people to expose myself to because I'm not interested in someone who's telling me that the earth is paradise, who's never had a problem in their life or never had a challenge or has had a very privileged life. I'm interested in the person who's been down into the depths 
had, you know, really tough time, but has come back, learned from it, grown from it, and still wants to cultivate light. To me, that's, that's my resonance. Thank you. Thank you. That was a beautiful answer and a really important answer, I feel, for many, many people who'll be listening to this, yeah, uh, or friends of people who are in emotions that they can't get out of, don't know how to get out of. So uh, thank you. That was a, a beautiful answer. We've been asked, what is the difference between a healer, an intuitive, and a way shower? Hmm. Well, uh, you can be all three at once. Maybe you're not, you know, living your skill. Uh, it, you're not, maybe you're not embodying all three at the same time, but sometimes you are. So I, I do not have the definitive answer for this question because I didn't create those words, but I'll, I'll give you my take on it. Yes. A way shower to me can be everything from you, Braca, who is, again, showing people back to light and expansion at times where we're seeing a lot of darkness rearing its head and attempting to control the narrative. Um, a way shower can also be the woman who I meet in a corridor one day that I'm walking past in a hospital when I'm really sad because I've left one of my relatives' hotel rooms, uh, hospital rooms, and um, she just smiles at me. And maybe if she and I sat down and talked about what we think about spirituality, the state of the world, we, would, we couldn't be more different. Like, you know, perhaps we have very different beliefs, but in that moment, she smiled at me and she showed me the way back to my heart because at that moment I was sunk. So to me, a way shower can take many forms, but I think the way that I see the word way shower light worker being used at the moment, it's people who are here to help seed, generate, cultivate, and protect higher consciousness on earth. Doesn't mean you're a perfect human being, none of us are. Doesn't mean you're free of lessons. Doesn't mean you're free of periods where you're not very capable of being a way, way shower. Life is life. But if it's in your wiring to want to help, to want to give, to want to uplift, whether that's in the area of nature and animals, you can't stand people. Oh, I can't stand people. I'm amazed I'm even watching this video with Bracker and Lee. Animals and nature are my favorite. You know, maybe that's your place of being a way shower. Um, that to me is what that word means. Healer, well, we're all healers to each other, sometimes inadvertently. So someone who is uh, aggressive to me or attacks me in some way um, can offer me a healing inadvertently if I'm willing to kind of look at what just happened and what came up for me and what do I need to move through. But healers are often people who can shift your frequency. So whether you go to them for Reiki, whether it's that friend who you always feel better, you get into their orbit and they have a healing effect on you and they shift your frequency. And maybe that's for a lifetime, or maybe it's for a season. And this healer is right for you for a season because of what you need. And an intuitive is somebody who is relying on senses beyond the linear world and what we're told. So, uh, you know, someone who doesn't tap into their intuition might be in this room with me and they might go, well, yeah, there's a picture, there's a day bed, there's a desk there's a computer and out the window I can see trees. And that might be what someone who isn't allowing or tapping into their intuition sees. Someone else might go, hmm, there's a really interesting energy here. I can feel that tree coming through the, through, through, the, through the window. And this tree seems very sunny and open. And this tree seems a little more suppressed. Uh, oh, and here's Braca. Oh, she's, oh, Braca. Oh, she looks like she's going through something today. Normally she's a little different. Well, I wonder what's, I'll just ask her a question and see and see what she says. So intuitives are feeling and sensing the unseen um, by the human eye and able to um, interpret it. And I think as we develop and grow as intuitives and allow that into our, ourselves, we get better at communicating about it uh, to ourselves and others and using it in our life so that we can be a little more harmonized with the world of energy. So the way I look at it, and this is what my guides say to me, they said this years ago and it really helped me. And I think this is true for everyone watching and listening. 
they said one day when I was struggling with the energy of the world, they said, it's because you walk an awkward line between the worlds. They, they didn't use the word awkward. I'm paraphrasing. There was a word they used, but they kind of, the, the implication was it's difficult to walk between the worlds. Sometimes it's easier to just be fully out there or fully on the earth and denying any of it exists because to be fair, you're not feeling it. So to you, it doesn't exist. You're not lying. Uh, to yourself necessarily. It's just perhaps not what you're designed to experience. So walking between the worlds and the human and the soul is very much how I'm composed. And um, I wouldn't have it any other way because I used to be much more human without the soul. Um, but at the same time, it can be can be tricky to navigate that sometimes. So I just offer that to anyone else who's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay that earth and its challenges and what people and animals and the earth is going through right now is challenging for you sometimes. That's the truth of where we're at right now. Yeah, that's beautiful. And what would you say at the moment, because you talked a little bit, Lee, that um, the energies are certainly speeding up and the healing energies are activating healing more quickly. Is there anything you would like to share with our viewers about what you're feeling about the energies, what's coming and what you're sensing. Well, what hits me when you ask me that question, thinking of whoever's watching and listening to this is don't be too alarmed if your relationships are changing. If you're someone who identifies with what Braca has just said, um, I think relationship changes always make us nervous because we are community beings. And my guides have explained that we are in much the same way that trees communicate with each other, trees in the same area, both through the root system sometimes, but also just energetically, they're in radio with each other. So are we as human beings, which is why division is insanity. But, you know, that's some of the insanity that's being plastered into us right now by certain groups or certain people. And, you know, that's, they say that's been going on since the beginning of time. It's just more in your face than ever before because the system has to destabilize in order to transform. Not easy to live through that, but you know that's kind of how they frame it. So one of the things that hits me regarding anyone listening and watching this, as you ask me that question is, just be patient with yourself and with others in your life at this time because your relationships will change. And it doesn't mean that many of them need to go away. Some of them will, some of them will go away completely. Some of them will be, you know, you, there will be endings. There are always endings for people that happens all the time on the planet, but you will be experiencing a deeper sense of yourself. And some days you're experiencing a deeper sense of your higher self, your biggest spirit. And other days you're experiencing a deeper sense of your contraction point. I had one two days ago where so a couple of things happened in the morning and I was like, like this. And Stephen, my husband said, are you okay? I thought I was fine. I walked into the kitchen and of course he knows my energy field very well. And, and when he said that to me, I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think, and, and what I worked, what I kind of later saw when I just backtracked, I was like, what was the trigger? What happened? Is there anything I need to see about that? I mean, if there isn't great, I'll move on. But if there is, let me just take a moment and look at it. And there was definitely some healing for me around uh, a couple of relationships in my life that I was still kind of moving through. But it, it wasn't the relationship that needed to change. It was, it was my energy field in relationship to the, the people. So I think sometimes we have a very black and white tendency to, you know, oh, well, this relationship isn't working, so I'll just cut them out or I'll tell them they're no longer in my life. And sometimes that's highly appropriate and that's a stage of relationship growth, especially if you've suppressed your truth or your power in a relationship. But there comes a point where you just you can ebb and flow with all of it. So the reason I'm focusing this to your people is you will be having a very intense experience of yourself right now at times, some of you, and equally, others are having a very intense experience of themselves. I saw a great newsletter the other day from uh, someone whose work I follow, and she apologized for adding to 
one of the polarity debates that's going on on the planet right now. You know, I'm not even going to name it because we're on YouTube. But um, yeah, one of the polarity debates. And I loved it because she backtracked what she'd done. She'd basically released an article talking about how insane she thought one group in this debate were. And she'd been flooded with letters of people explaining their position and explaining why for them it was actually very hard for them to kind of, it, it opened her mind. And she basically said, the last thing I want to do is add to the division on this planet. And I, it, it took me back to my roots and it took me back to the truth of the work I do. And I'm sorry, and I'll do better. And, you know, wherever you stand on this debate, we're all here, we're all connected. And I think that was healthy because from my perspective, the debate is being fueled by very low consciousness. Uh, and being fueled, being being sent into us as a people um, from a very low consciousness place, and the argument is presented as very black and white, and everything in my intuitive body uh, tells me it is not black and white at all. So it's interesting because there are certain things we can say here, and there are certain things we can't. So, um, but I, I I loved she did that, and it was a moment for me of this is great. She had a healing moment, and she came back. She came back to herself. She came back to the group, and she got beyond the uh, the war that is being encouraged on the planet. That we have to um, we have to be able to transmute and move beyond. Yes, no, that's beautiful. I, I had a similar thing that came up with the Pleiadians. Pam Gregory was interviewing them. And one of the questions was around being a vegetarian and eating meat. And as you know, that's a very hot potato. Very and much. Their answer was <laughs> that each must learn and do what is right for them. And I've had a barrage of mm -hmm. uh, unsubscribers of people saying, how could they possibly say that? How, you know, how could anybody be cruel to animal? You know, all this polarized field you know came up uh from that and again it's just this divisive energy uh so quickly ignited at the moment with the energies yes but i i think it's an interesting time for us especially those of us who are on social media um either for your personal life or for work that you do because a lot of the division is sown there so I have noticed more polarizing, especially over on a platform beginning with F. Um, I've noticed that, and, and even, and I don't scroll there very often at all. Obviously we, we use it for my work, but I, I'm not somebody who's actively scrolling and not anymore, there was a time. Um, but I have noticed the nervous system response of people over on that platform has escalated. So I think it's easier for people to get inflamed and throw a bomb at someone else. And so I think it's an interesting, um, it's, I mean, I, I know exactly what you're talking about with, um, you know, and, and I, you know, and I, I understand that the new weapon is unsubscribe or unfollow to some people, which I have to be honest, always makes me smile. Cause I'm like, well, I was here when I had no followers and I'll, I'll be here again. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to, hold on to you, which is interesting. But I, I know some people when they're very angry, they want to kind of, you know, throw that at you. And, and it's not the action of unsubscribing that's actually offensive. It's probably the energy they're sending you away. And um, I think it's interesting because do we follow other people because we just want them to reaffirm our belief system, which is fine. You know, there are certain artists I like, music artists, and I don't mind that they're doing the same album over and over, and over again because I like them for that and I'm, I'm there. But equally, there are other artists I follow because they're always changing me and they're always shifting the sound. And, and, and so I think it's, personally, I've never thrown a bomb on social media. So I don't know what's going on for those people and I don't know what there is going on in their life. But it, the polarization is real. And I think it's very important uh, when you get caught in a personal reaction to someone's comment right now, to, if you can, step back from it and go, this is not personal, because it isn't. And, and, you know, there's nothing more impersonal than someone on a YouTube screen that you want to throw a rock at, because you don't have a relationship with that person. You have a relationship with their work, and you have a relationship with their work very much through your own filter. I mean, I've, I experienced this way back at the beginning. I would put a video out, and someone would say, 
oh, that video was all about that. And I'd be like, oh, okay. And then someone else would go, oh, that video was all about something completely different. And I'd be like, oh. Or people would say to me, oh, Lee, you look, you look very sad this month. And I, I it was always strange because if I, I used to look at the comments more back in the day, and I would think, actually, I'm really happy this month. Last month, I was sad. And a few of you told me I look really well. So, you know, it's kind of, it, I've kind of learned, like, I'm really happy to put my work out there. But I'm increasingly good, uh, increasingly good, and I'll continue to get better at completely disengaging from a mass crowd response because it's it's not good for anyone to be on the receiving end of that, positive or negative, you know. So I think I think it's interesting that you bring that up, Bracker. And I know I've kind of added a few layers to what you've said, but I think it's important for all of us to get a little more wise about the fact that this division energy is out there and it's its own kind of, I won't say the word, but it begins with V um, and it's spreading, it's spreading. And people, there are certain people who want it to spread. And that's the thing that we have to be mindful of. And, and it will spread and there'll be people who get behind it, but you have to make a choice for yourself about, do I wanna play this game or am I going to abstain from certain areas where that kind of thing is going on? Absolutely. I'm going to get caught up in it. I was reading a quote by Rumi today. Can't remember the actual words. But, you know, if, if you think there's so much chaos in the world, just go out one night and look at the stars. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. And can I share with you? Oh, my God. I went to Santa Fe um, this summer to visit some friends. And uh, my friend is wonderful. And she often puts books in my lap that she thinks I should read or see. And um, very wise, intuitive friend. And she gave me this book that was a channeled book. And I can't even remember what it was called, but it was published in 1919. And I opened the book on the first page. And the first chapter, I almost fell off my chair. It said something along the lines of, we live in very troubling times, but don't lose hope. And I was like, what? 102 years ago, I was like, oh, and it just reminded me, you know, and the Z's say this, they say, even though you're in a very unique time in human history, a lot of what we're seeing right now is, 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 a, is a conglomerate of, of ancestral issues that we've been working through forever. And it was just a good reminder to me. I was like, you know, to not, it's not to not take now seriously, because I think it's hard to not take now. You never get to not take now seriously for, for too long before you're brought back to the seriousness of things. But it was a good reminder to me of the cycles of life, the cycles of being human, the cycles of the earth. And I thought, wow, that could have been written now. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. And more and more, what I'm seeing is that books that were written, somebody recommended today a book written in 1919 about how dentistry and things in the mouth and nose are the greatest effect of any kind of chronic illness or chronic uh -huh. anything in the body. You sort out the nose and the mouth and you sort out everything. From and did there. you just say this was 1919? 1990. So that's the exact same year. So I think, Bracker, we need a time machine because I think they knew what was going on back then. We need to we need to go back. And <laughs> this is brilliant. I love this. It's fascinating, isn't it? When you look at it through that lens and you I think the thing I always remember is how small we are. Like on the one hand, I understand it's that we as a culture don't realize how vast we are and how connected we are to everything. And that, you know, that's always going to be my life's work and my walk. But at the same time, it's very important to remember that, you know, we are in a way we're a tribe of ants on the planet right now, too. And at some point we'll be gone and another tribe will be here. So it's kind of good to keep that perspective. And like you said, on that overwhelming day I had a few days ago, I, I just went outside and looked at the trees and looked at the sky. And when I did that, of course, I immediately started to reconnect and my energy field started to change because I wasn't engaged in. Uh, if you like, human or cultural energy right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's just a key. When everything begins to get too much, had a scratchy throat yesterday, was all going on. And I just went out to the beach, walked, lay in the sand, paddled along the beach. And within 10 minutes, everything was back in alignment again. So 
Mother Earth is is really there to support us and help us. Yeah, time. and you know, I I lived in a lot of small apartments um, in my twenties and 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 a good half of my thirties or more actually, and so I would often not have a garden or a balcony or a yard, but I would bring really nice plants in, or I would you know go to the local park, and because I know not everybody lives in a nature spot, although I know a lot of us choose to kind of migrate that way. Um, the more the more we wake up a bit, I think, and the more we recognize we need that, we need that connection with nature, but still you can find it everywhere. Um, so it's just about choosing to connect with the natural world in whatever way you can. That's beautiful. Lee, I could talk with you for hours. Same. I'm also quite conscious that you're a very, very busy man and you've got, a, I think, some other commitments. So I, had I do. I have a few more minutes, but yeah, I could speak to you all day too. You know, so I felt like, right, let's, I, I need to just begin. Maybe, maybe you'll honor me with, uh, you'll honor us with coming back at some point if you have the time. I would love um, that. But let's see. Um, perhaps you'd just like to share a little more of your work. What, what are your things that you are doing at the moment and just share with our people? They're hungry for more of you. Sure. So um, I have a YouTube channel, Lee Harris Energy, and um, every month I do normally, a, it's normally like 25 to 30 minutes. Um, I call it an energy update. It comes out on the first of every month. And I go through normally six to eight energetic themes that I receive from my guides, usually the day before. And I talk about how they might show up in your life, how to deal with them. And also, I think sometimes what I see uh, what, what people tell me about the energy updates is it helps clarify or confirm what they're feeling um, because I'm coming from an intuitive place. So I think if, if people resonate with it, then it, it can help them kind of confirm or expand their own intuition. So I do those every month on YouTube. They're for free. And uh, we yes. normally put about three or four, you know, three to four videos out a week, including my Impact the World podcast, which goes out on YouTube every Monday. And is also on Apple Podcasts and anywhere that you can download podcasts. Um, and then lastly, we, uh, with Davor Bozik, um, I create music. So we create um, music albums to uh, tuned to 528 hertz, which is a healing frequency. But for example, an album that came out last November is called Awaken. And it's kind of a hybrid of what you might call some new age style songs and some kind of regular songs, if you like. And we, uh, we actually will have a couple more albums coming out in the next kind of nine months. So we've been working away behind the scenes on all of that. So you can find all of that and my members community, the portal, um, where I do a deep dive every month with my members for 90, 90 plus minutes, usually including channeling from the Z's, answering people's questions, um, and also an MP3 every single month that's usually an hour or so long. That's a message that's aligned with either what we're going through right now or something to, to help you stabilize yourself. And you can find all the details of that over at theportal.world or you just go to my website to find all of the things I'm talking about, leeharrisenergy.com. Thank you, Lee. And I, Thank you. I highly highly recommend that you do go and check everything that Lee does. He's so versatile. He does so many different things. And I have to be honest, you know, this was a big stretch for me today to interview you. I was a little nervous and excited. Oh, oh. <laughs> thank well, you. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for you, Bracca. I mean, I said this to you when I interviewed you, but if ever I, if ever I need a ray of sunshine and I will say, informed hope not 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 frilly hope not hope that's just pasted on but informed hope it's not just your work but just your energy field i mean you beam so thank you for being you and for doing what you do and for being out there so that the rest of us if ever we need a little bracket fix can just press play on a video and uh yeah i honor you and everything you've done and it was really my honor to be here so thank you for having me Thank you, Lee. Really much big love to you, as you say, big love.
You and, too, um, you too, my friend. Thank you to Lucy and my team uh, helping with the moderating. The chat's been very lively there, and we'll be sharing this video far and wide. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you. Much love. Bye for now. Thank bye you. bye.